Hey, this is Christian with The Most High Show, and today I'm sitting with my good friend, Britt Paramore. He is the lead therapist for Pathlight Counseling in Woodstock, Georgia. We're going to talk about the social aspect of addiction. We're going to talk about the psychological aspect of addiction, and we're going to talk a little bit about his uh, teen IOP that they just started and how they're addressing addiction for young people in their area. All that and more on this episode of The Most High Show. Welcome to The Most High Show, a show about recovery, spirituality, and all that. Produced, posted, and hosted by people in recovery who have strength and hope and want to share it with you. If you or someone you love is suffering, we want you to know you are not alone. This is The Most High Show. So, Britt, you're a licensed counselor. And uh, pastor, would you say you're a pastor as well? I am a pastor, yes. Yeah. And so your path, we've talked a lot um, over the last couple of years, your path to getting into counseling. And I know that initially when you first got into the schooling, right, You your initial thought was, okay, I got to get this psychology stuff down, uh, but I just got to go through it. Yeah. And then you had an experience in school that, that really opened your eyes to yeah. uh, the psychological approach to therapy. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. When I, uh, in, in 2009, when I went to, to treatment in North Carolina, I stayed there for a year, decided I wanted to go to school to work with guys in addiction ministries. And, you know, at the time I didn't believe psychology had any value to offer the world at all I was going to use a and learn how to do uh, what's called nuthetic counseling which is a strictly biblical approach and so but it, it's difficult not impossible to get uh, state credentials without having gone through and graduated an accredited clinical program mm-hmm. And so I entered an accredited clinical program, not to learn the clinical side of things, just to give me credentials so that I could reach more people. And it was, it was my first class that I took, Dr. Myers, uh, Liberty University. And I told him these things, Dr. Myers, I'm just doing this for the credential. You know, these days, credentials mean everything in the medical field. And... I told him that, that I don't think psychology has any value whatsoever. And he asked me a couple questions. He said uh, he had a Bible sitting in front of him. And, uh, you know, I went to a clinical program, but all the doctors and professors were also Christ followers. So he had a Bible in front of him, and he asked me, do you believe every word in this Bible is, is God's truth? I said, every single word. Then he asked me, do you believe all of God's truth is in this Bible? And I had to think about that one for a minute, and I said, no, you know, God's revealed truths through creation, Romans chapter 1 tells us, and he asked me, are you part of God's creation? Yes. Is your brain and personality and emotional state part of God's creation? Yes. Then don't you believe understanding God's word and God's creation is really understanding all of God's truth? Yes, I do. And I was, uh, I was hooked, no pun intended, on, on psychology that day. Yeah. When I first got into it, <clears throat> I thought that psychology was just giving people advice, right? Yeah. It's like, I'm good at giving people advice. <laughs> and it was also my first semester in graduate school that a professor in my ethics class uh, said, if you think that counseling is about giving people advice, you're in the wrong program. Well, that's exactly what I thought. Yeah. But over the years, through the program, through internship, residency, I really, really learned that if, if, if I will give the science of psychology a shot and really, really uh, find the things that, that suit my counseling style, my therapeutic style, and then integrate those things in with with biblical truths and faith a faith based foundation. It's extremely effective. Yeah. And since that day, uh, we've been offering. I've been offering what we call 
integrative psychology, which is integrating different psychological uh, therapeutic approaches. They're called uh, therapeutic frameworks, like cognitive behavioral therapy, rational emotive behavior therapy, solution focus, brief therapy. There's about 20 really good ones, mm -hmm. right? And learning how those work, learning how to build a framework around a treatment plan, and then implementing that with structure, with very specific and defined goals, and really importantly, uh, with accurate expectations. I think one of the biggest issues that arises in counseling when a patient's expectations exceed reality, yeah, and it's in that gap where frustration happens. It's like I'm gonna get everything back happens. in five days. I'm gonna. That's exactly it. Yeah, right. I've been sober ten days. Why doesn't my wife forgive me? And why aren't all my kids happy to see me? And that's the same thing I thought. I know I'm doing better, you know. Yeah. The first eight rehabs I didn't, but that ninth one I knew I was doing better, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was many, many years before my uh, family and those close to me really fully came around. But luckily, it didn't go from totally bad to totally good. It was uh, it was a steady and and. Uh, general increase where they started to trust me more, trust me more. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been the best time of my life. Uh, I never could imagine I could love to do something as much as I love to, to counsel people struggling with some of the things I used to struggle with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like, um, that's a big thing. Um, I think Andrew was, we were talking uh, once with Andrew and he was saying that, um, he had had a counselor or somebody and it was obvious they had never struggled with right. addiction themselves. Right. And how little, um, weight that carried for him. Right. It's like, yeah, how do you know? Right. Like you're, you're kind of telling me this textbook answer, but when somebody who has been there can, and also is now equipped with some tools and some knowledge and some information, that just it bears so much more weight for someone who's on the other side listening to that counselor that says okay maybe i can trust you yep. and trust what you're saying might be true yeah and addiction is almost wholly unique like that the only other thing that's close to addiction are veterans struggling with ptsd it's really important that that counselor sitting across from them has experienced similar things and you know, when I was going through school, we go through uh, all three years with uh, a cohort, the same 30-something people, right? Yeah. And everybody in that program had dealt with something in the past. You know, I've, yeah. I've rarely met somebody that goes in this field who doesn't have something in their past. And I think right. out of the 37 in my cohort, I was the only one that had struggled with addiction. Huh. Some of them anxiety, depression, trauma, PTSD, attention deficit disorder, autism. And so while I do treat all of those, and praise God, I've never struggled with, with any of those, uh, addiction was my struggle. And so there's just something different about it. If I've got a person sitting across from me who has no addictive issues but struggling with generalized anxiety disorder, it's not important to them if I've experienced anxiety right? right, or depression. And yeah. those are really similar. But with addiction, there's something about not only us as the addicted people, but the counselors. We have a, a kinship and a bond yeah. built through misery, right? Yeah. And until you've experienced that misery, until you've you know, slept in a park in the winter like I have, it's just kind of hard to... To, to explain it in such a way so that it resonates with other people. But yeah. If I've got somebody sitting across from me, our miseries aren't identical, but they're always going to be really, really, really similar. Yeah. And it's just this special thing. Uh, and I, uh, I would say 95% of the people I treat had looked for several other programs and counselors and they, they weren't going to settle on one until they found someone who had, struggle with addiction. And yeah. That's what empathy is. Well, it reminds me of uh, years and years ago, I, my main pursuit was music. And so I was in this band and we were 
we got picked up in Bakersfield, California by a limousine and brought down into L.A. by uh, the bass player for Korn. You remember the band Korn? Yeah, of course. So they bring us down there, and uh, they're they're entertaining, possibly uh, signing us to their little record label. And so, you know, we're... We're riding in a limo all the way down there, and I'm giving oh. the grandiose version of the story because it's worth it. Gotcha. And so, you know, we've, we've arrived. We ain't signed no deal, but we've arrived, right? We got picked up. And so we get down there to his house, big old house with an elevator in it and a giant studio, and and a couple of the corn band members come in, and we're all hanging out, and they were talking about their pro- hiring a producer. They were going to work on a new record, and they had a couple producers, and... What was interesting, the guitar player said, what they always do is when a producer comes in, no matter how credentialed they are, they'll give him a guitar and ask him to tune it. Right. And if he don't know how to tune the guitar, that's not our producer. No chance. No chance. Right. Because this guy's got to know how to play the guitar. He's got to know how to tune it. He's got to feel the feeling we feel. Yeah. Right? And that's that's something kind of similar. There's something about... You know, being a musician, being a creative, being someone who's been through addiction, w- there is a certain kinship, yeah. a level of honesty, a level of transparency that's required, really. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And, yeah. you know, I think one of the biggest problems many of us have had is we just don't think anybody understands us. Like, yeah. I think a lot of times our families think that our formerly good loved one has just turned bad. Like, right. what's up with that? And we try to explain it to them in such a way that it's not exactly like that. This stuff is powerful, right? And I've seen a lot of family members literally just never, ever, ever get it. And yeah. that leaves the addicted person in the family on an island. Yeah. They're, they're different. There's something wrong with them that is not the same thing wrong with everybody else in their family, and they're ostracized. And when we feel like we're on an island and we're ostracized, well, we're going to go straight yeah. to the thing that that makes us feel better in that yeah. moment. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. One of the things, or, or every patient that comes through one of our programs, we do family counseling with their family. Yeah. And I tell them, you know, they're, they're nervous. Oh my gosh, you're going to bring my husband in here, my wife in here. And I tell them, I promise you, you want me to bring them in here Yeah. because I'm going to explain it to them in such a way so that it might change their mind just a little bit that you weren't just bad trying to get good. Right. There's a lot more at play here. It's extremely dynamic. Yeah. And so I think when families can really understand that and these days can see brain images from PET scans and MRIs, it right. starts to click a little bit. What, don't you? Is this your experience as well? What I've noticed in a lot of doing these podcasts and interviewing people and hearing other people who struggle with addiction, their story, that I, I hear these kind of words in some form which is, um, I knew I was different before the drugs and alcohol. Yeah. The world, it's almost as if us alcoholics and addicts know something about the world that the rest of the world doesn't know, whatever it is. Yeah. And this is before we even pick up a drink or a drug. We already have this thing in us that tells us we're not part of the pack, we're not right. part of the group, that was a big thing for me in my drug use was the sense of belonging, running with the crew, getting high, doing graffiti and stuff. That was like a part of the process, right? Belonging. And so this sense of, of belonging, I think, is a core issue for at least most of the addicts that I've talked to. That so it's, in, I say this often, uh, that the number one character flaw, uh, character weakness that people who struggle with addiction have is almost a pathological low self-esteem and you know never really really feeling like you fit in like you perceive other people to fit in to the crowd and of course in 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 high school when you know kids are still cruel and there's nothing more you want than to go out with the 
the head cheerleader or hang out with that popular crowd. And it might be totally, and I think it was totally my perception or misperception, but I was convinced that anyone who I talked to, uh, tried to befriend, did not like me or yeah. did not like me the way they liked other people. Right. And, you know, when I started using drugs, that went away immediately. And then I started gravitating towards other people just like me. And guess what? We all accepted each other. Right. Right. But you were saying that when you would meet people, you all, and, and then once you got into where you're using with other people, there's a, there's a common bond, right. which um, might be, you know, partially because, like, if everybody's on the same thing. Right. Right. Like uh, uh, mushrooms, like me and my friends took mushrooms together. We're all having a very similar interpretation right. of reality during the time right. we're on that, you know? And so there's part of that, but I do think that there, um, you know, I don't know. Th th this is kind of like, this is a concept I have, all right? All right. So let me just talk about this concept. So the concept I have is, you know, we, we have the term alcoholic, mm -hmm. okay? And... Large in part that that term is is interpreted as someone who has an allergy to alcohol, right? But if if I was to define the term alcoholic, I would call it a spiritual malady, okay. a spiritual condition that not everybody who has a substance abuse problem or an alcohol problem is alcoholic. I agree with that. That some people, if you remove them from the outside influences, you remove them from the negative situations, and then remove the, the alcohol, you remove the need for the alcohol, and they don't have the problem. Right. Some people, like me, you can take away every substance. I am still going to have a problem with me. Right. It's a spiritual malady. It's a spiritual condition that I'm always going to be and I've noticed that in, in working with some people and just talking with people, is sometimes I think, you know, maybe this term alcoholic is a little more specific than just the, the drunkard, yeah. you know. Uh, because when you read, well, for me, you know, I practice the 12 steps. And when I read those, that 12-step literature, and it, when I walk someone else through the 12-step literature, and they do the same thing I do. They laugh at the same marks. They go, how is this is me? Right. It's like this is something, you know, yeah. it, it in, in for the 12 steps step specifically, it's a spiritual solution is the solution to the to a spiritual problem. And, and for you, like doing this, what you call integrated, you're you're addressing, you're connecting the spiritual solution into it. Yeah, I absolutely am. And it's it's funny to me. Uh, I'll have a person struggling with addiction sit down. They've never talked to a counselor before. And I'll tell them I'm not a prophet, right? I, I don't have a crystal ball. And then I proceed to tell them all these detailed things about their life. And I'd never met them before mm -hmm. because we all have so much in common. Yeah. Right. And so for me, you know, I did not like myself. Yeah. Right? And so I was, I didn't like myself, you know, in high school. So I was certain you didn't like me, but I could make an effort to become what I think you will like. Yes. And so I build this wall, right? And a character. This is all you're going to see a character. Yeah. It can be one thing for you, right? Uh -huh. It can be another thing for you. It yeah. can be another thing for you. You put on that persona for so long, you lose what's, what's behind the wall you've built. Yeah. Right. And you wake up one day and one of the things I hear uh, a lot of addicts and alcoholics talk about is, you know, early in recovery, they didn't know who they were. Yeah. In fact, the most profound occurrence uh, in this life of sobriety has been knowing exactly who I am. Right. The psychological term is is coined by Abraham Maslow. Those of you took Psych 101 and. In college, you've heard of Abraham Maslow and Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of needs. Hmm. And just to refresh your memory, uh, Dr. Maslow made a hierarchy, right? 
and of the most basic needs all people have. And if you don't have those needs met organically, you'll try to meet them synthetically, huh. right? If they're not met naturally, you'll try, you'll do anything to meet them, right? And the third on the hierarchy is, is love and belonging, right? We need to feel loved by and belong to two groups of people, a family and a peer group, right? Yeah. And when that, you might, you might be a part of a family that perfectly accepts you and you belong to, but you don't ever feel quite like you fit in with your peer group. And if Dr. Maslow was correct, and I absolutely believe he was, that is almost as powerful as not having your physiological needs met, like food, air, water, shelter. Yeah. Right? And when we don't have those needs met, oftentimes morality is out the window. It's like the guy who's yeah. never stolen anything in his life, but he and his family are starving, and he knows all he's got to go to do is go down to the store and steal something to feed his family. He's not concerned whatsoever about the morality of that, no. right? Because morality is out the window. And now, with the new brain scan technology, we can literally see the part of the brain where God put morality not barely part of the decision-making process for someone who's struggling with addiction, especially in the grips of addiction, they're almost literally running on instinct. Right? Now, now, when you say struggling, it, you're, this is more than just when they're under the influence of a substance. No, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, the, the brain is plastic, neuroplasticity, which means the brain can heal itself. The yeah. brain, brain and the liver uh, and the skin are, are three things that can do that. And so, you know, when you're literally in the grips of addiction, when I was going on a cocaine bender, right, I would, as soon as I started to come down, I would go steal from anybody. I would do anything to get it, yeah. even from the ones I loved the most. But even three days after that last use, I've made my mind up, I'm not using again. Mm -hmm. Wake up one day. I'm committed, I'm not using today, and some trigger will pop up, and then you start playing, uh, you start playing that tape in your mind, you know, when you got the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder, do it, don't do it, do it, don't yeah. do it. And I always listen to the devil, yeah. right? And in that moment, in that moment where I make the decision I'm gonna go use again, there's no stopping me. I, right. used, I used to start to throw up the second I made a decision. Really? An hour before I got drugs. As soon as I made that decision, yeah. I would start to throw up. Right? You were having a physiological reaction. Yeah, it's called psychosomaticism. See, I and I had that the first year of my sobriety. Um, a glass table, I would have a physical reaction. Yeah, I get that, yeah. A hotel room, I couldn't stay in a hotel room. I would drive by this one hotel on the way to my rehab, I would go back to my rehab and visit and speak there. Right. And on the way to it, I would drive by this hotel where I used to cop at. Right. And just looking over and seeing that hotel, I didn't even have to look over. It was like my body knowing I was in proximity right. to that hotel. My, I would get bubble guts, you know, I would get antsy. And it, it was a very long time before that went away. Yeah, I, I got out of Dodge. Uh, you know, the, the city I grew up in. You grew up in Dodge? <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, my parents still live there. I go visit, and I'll drive past that exit, right, that I got used to cop on and the exits I've been arrested on. Yeah. And that's been a long time ago, and to this day, it makes me feel some kind of way yeah. that I don't like driving past that. While there's no... Such thing as a geographical cure for addiction. Yeah. Sometimes it can be a really good decision to get out of Dodge. Yeah. Which I did. And so, you know, when it comes to that pathological low self-esteem, that love and belonging need that I didn't have met, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's reality or your perception, when it comes to these things, perception is reality. Yeah. And that went on and on for so long that... You know, I forgot who I was. I had no idea who I was. I know I didn't like it. Uh, and so my 
my journey exploration to finding myself had a lot to do with first coming to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity yeah and then seriously seriously turning my will and my life over to the care of Jesus and so I started to read the Bible I started to devour it hours and hours every day and I'd come to the conclusion this is God's Word and when I started to read some of the things he said about people who follow him Mm -hmm. and I started to internalize that and on some level seeing myself through God's eyes Mm -hmm. what other people thought about me became less important do I still struggle with it yes I do will I struggle with it for the rest of my life maybe I will it's nowhere close than it used to be right and for me you know just just hearing or reading God's word reading those things that he says about me that he's cast my sins as far as the east is from the west that though my sins were like scarlet he made them white as snow that he works all things together for the good of those who love him. Right? Yeah. That we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Internalizing those things turns down uh, the the need for approval from others. Yeah. Not fully. Of course, I need to worry, but my, my wife thinks about me, <laughs> yeah. my business partners, and uh, but today it it, it doesn't control me like it once did yeah absolutely and that's you know a lot of that is um for you having that that experience in reading scripture it really it really spoke to you and um not everybody has that kind of response and reaction to scripture um but they and this is what this is what i really like about what pathlight does and what you what you do and how you choose to, you know, because there there are people. And how can I say this? There are people who absolutely believe and love scripture, and can and can translate the value of it mm-hmm. to another person in a way that doesn't condemn, cast shame, put the shoulds and woulds in there, mm-hmm. you know. And I think that's that's one of the gifts that you have. Thank and, you. And I think. Um, particularly like in that one-on-one setting, somebody who's coming from a Christian background, which we're in Georgia, right. so it's a high probability you're dealing with a lot of people who come from the faith of their fathers is yep. Christianity. So you have a framework already that's a spiritual framework that exists that gives you some kind of good language to use. It gives right. you it gives you good um, metaphors, and you know, it gives you this kind of whole... Um, I don't want to say mythos, but it it gives you kind of like a framework to work with and say, hey, you have an idea of what God is and who God is, right? You have an understanding, which is the beauty of Jesus, right? Jesus gives us a very tangible image of God, right? right? Uh, And so you're able to kind of to translate that and then in in using that with um, positive psychology, Mm -hmm. with accountability, Mm -hmm. with goal setting, and all these things, it's a. This is a multifaceted. It's a complex situation. The disease of addiction. Yeah, I think that it's the most complex and thus interesting disease in in the field of medicine, the field yeah. of psychology, because it it affects us all, right? It it affects every bit of us. It affects us biologically, our bodies, our physical makeup. But it has physical effects on us mm-hmm. and genetics absolutely can and does play a role in it and that's our yeah. biological makeup it affects us psychologically uh, leads to depression leads to anxiety leads to attention deficit dis- uh, issues and can also be caused by depression anxiety impulsivity, ADD type issues. Yeah. It certainly affects us socially. That's the one that is most out in front because that's our relationships and our job. Yeah. Right. And, uh, as you mentioned, it is a spiritual malady and thus affects us spiritually. Yeah. Uh, it's a little more socially acceptable to be a person in recovery now. I used to be ashamed of it. Right. Yeah. And still dealing with low self-esteem, 
can't let anybody know I've ever had any kind of weakness. And that started to change the first time I got to, to give my testimony, and it was, it was really cool seeing how people responded to it. Yeah. And so I went from being ashamed to talk about it to talking about it everywhere I go now. Yeah. And here's what I found. You know, in this world where we all act like everything's going on, we're perfect, we don't have any problems, especially in church. Yeah. A lot of churches like that. Everything's fine. Yep, everything's Bobby's fine. Bobby's fine. Susie's right. fine. We're fine. And everything's fine. You know, <laughs> my pastor, uh, Chuck Ramsey at Restoration Church, this Sunday said, we see you. We really see you. Yeah. And you can see me. What's the point in hiding when you're already seen? Yeah. And so, good. you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll have a, a patient tell me this, like, Pastor Britt, you are nothing like <laughs> the pastors I grew up with. Now, that don't mean I'm all that even close. It's the opposite of it. Yeah. But what drew me and, and what drives me has never been shame, condemnation, guilt, right? If, if punishment, shame, guilt worked, I would have only been arrested one time instead of 15 times, mm. right? It was love that drew me, yeah. right? It was love that kept me. And so a lot of people jaded by uh, church because of the way they grew up, yeah. because of some of the people they've seen in it, yeah. and they consider it a place of condemnation, yeah. right? And God does have a, a lot of condemning things to say about sin, but never about the sinner. Right. And so we have a rule at Pathlight that there's nothing you can tell me that will cause me to judge you. And I'm not just saying that, like, literally, I will not judge you. Yeah. Uh, and Well, I over the years, you've probably heard some wild shit, so... We can do a couple yeah. programs on that, man. Yeah. And, and in your own experience, too, it's like somebody tells you something, you're like, yeah, well, that's not surprising. No, it doesn't. Right? Nothing surprising. The, the one time I've ever really been shocked, I was working at a high dollar rehab up in Virginia, you know, like 30 grand a month type place. Right. Yeah. And it was for, there was a lot of medical professionals there, right? There was pharmacists, mm -hmm. uh, all different kinds of doctors. And I had a neurosurgeon who was one of my patients, right? Doing spine and, and, and brain surgery. Uh, at least two or three times a week. And oh. one of the nurses caught her going into surgery drunk. And Whoa. she'd been doing it for a couple of years. Wow. And it wasn't that that shocked me. That was a little shocking. It was her complete and total uh, inability to see what was the big deal about that. Wow. And so, and interestingly enough, and I've worked in a couple of places like that, and I can't stand places like that, right? Yeah. Because most of the people, all they're thinking about is what they're missing out on by having to be there. Yeah. You know, places like... Let me hurry up and get through this so I can get right. back and go and, and do what I need to do because I just got to check this box. That's exactly right. And, you know, I would have gone to rehab in a trailer in the woods if somebody would have said they'd help me at the end. And so yeah. I went to a place that was 150 bucks for a whole year. Oh, and really? And... All I remember about those first few days is just, I'm so grateful to be here, right? I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah. Go, so grateful to be here. And that's when it changed, when I, was, when I was grateful to do whatever it took and to listen to people to change. Willingness. Instead, yep. Instead of needing them to think that I'm all that. Absolutely. My time uh, in there, in the rehab was... What I wanted to do was hurry up and go fix everything. Yep. That was, I had so much, it was like I finally got sober. It was the first time I'd been sober for more than, you know, three days in a row. You know, so I'm seven, eight days in, and the first few weeks you can't call nobody. And I'm like waking up to myself and going, oh, shit, I need to go back and fix. Right. And I just wanted to go back and fix everything. And, um, you know, I'm glad I went to a place, you know. Because I, I needed to be removed because I left to my own. And again, like me wanting to go back and fix things, that's the opposite of surrendering to a higher power. It's the exact opposite. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's me saying, okay, I, oh, I see it. I'll go fix this. God, I'm going to go do fix this for you. 
right? And it's the opposite of saying, uh, I surrender my will in life to your care and control. Yeah. And, and uh, you will fix this in your time. And it's taken, I've, you know, my growth as a sober person has, you know, been, you know, two steps forward, one step back, you know, when it, especially emotionally and in my thinking, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's three steps forward and two steps back. And it's just it's like back and forth. And what I'm learning now is when the pain is there, when the tension is there, when the uncomfortability is there in sobriety, I'm starting to have empirical evidence that, oh, a change is going to come. Right. I'm about to turn a corner. You know, and you learn that over time in recovery. When you're a couple of days sober, it's really hard to be like, you know, uh, we had my friend Brian, who, who's a, a counselor on, and he said it's really hard to tell a guy who's 10 days sober from heroin to go take a walk with his dog. Right. Because he's still got the vivid memory of what heroin feels like. Yeah. A walk with his dog is not going to be helpful. Right. At me, nine years sober, I just got that advice yesterday. You need to go take a walk with your dog. That makes sense, right? right. So um, how, what's it like for you, like, you have you have clients come in. They're in there for like an hour, right? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing your sessions are about right. an hour or so, mm -hmm. and then you, and then they gotta walk out of there. Yeah. What's that like for you? Like hoping and wishing and praying. Like man, like what's that? Well, first off, you know when I talk about no judgment, you know, I, I'm a I'm not a big fan of measuring perfection instead of progress mm -hmm. right and so you know i've seen a lot of people who for a decade or more they're intoxicated 99 percent of the time mm -hmm. they go to treatment they get out they slip up they go back to treatment get out slip up go back to treatment and that happens for two years right but they're sober 99 percent of the time that is progress and if we yeah, set right. up an environment where relapse is met with shame and judgment, then they're just not going to tell us, right. right? And so we not only develop relapse prevention plans at Pathlight, we develop what to do when you relapse. Mm -hmm. And when somebody's honest about it, we go overboard with respect. And, you know, the reason I used to be ashamed to, to tell my story is because I didn't want to be judged and I thought they would. Mm -hmm. And when I finally did, I noticed something completely different. It is, it is very endearing when someone is open about their faults because it makes me feel like I'm not the only one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It actually draws people to you because people respect humility yeah. and people respect honesty. I'll tell you the best advice I ever got ever I was at a teen challenge in South Dakota and my counselor said you need to erase yourself <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant by that though I'd spent some time with him you know I had a a wooden foundation and I was trying to build a cinder block house on top of it and yeah. that's backwards right? right I needed to wipe away everything that I had built and build a solid foundation before I was going to be able to build on that foundation, yeah. which is getting out and fixing things. Right. Once I got a strong foundation, right. Yeah. A storm may come. It may even, you know, blow some of the roof off, but it sure is easy to fix yeah. when you have a solid foundation. And, uh, and I'll never forget that. No, never yeah. forget that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really good. Um, I find myself telling uh, people early on is to remove yourself from the situation when you're thinking about it, yeah. when you're looking at how you're going to address it, take yourself out of that. And then now how do you address it? Um, one thing or my wife, Leslie would say to me like, well, what would you tell one of your people when I'm having an issue with something? Mm -hmm. And I would go, Oh man, cause now I gotta take my own advice. Right. <laughs> All right. So Pathlight has just launched um, a teen IOP. Correct. An intensive outpatient program. Correct. For, for teens. 
13 to 18. 13 to 18. And uh, I'm imagining you've done that because there's a need for it. Tremendous need. Yeah. And so what, what, what's the need that you see that, that made you go, you know, we need to do something about this? Yeah, and so I really like to do things in com- in the community, right? Yeah. I used to be a blight on my community, and it, it was always a dream of mine to be a blessing in my community. So I volunteer on different stuff, and uh, a couple different of the, the groups I volunteer with address suicide and addiction amongst teenagers, adolescents and teens in our community. Mm-hmm. And just being a part of that, you get to see things that you wouldn't normally get to see by just having a counseling practice, right? Yeah. And you get to see just how much more prevalent mental health, addiction, and suicide are in high schools and junior highs today than they were even when I was in junior high and high school. Right? Yeah. Something's changed. Yeah. And so whenever I see something like that, it really intrigues me. And so I've always loved working with kids. So I just started out in uh, our private practice at Pathlight Counseling. I just started out seeing teens and kids. I'd been doing that a while. I kind of put the word out that I was willing to see more because there's not very many of us who will see teens and kids in my community. And the, it, I was inundated with parents and kids who need help so much so we got on a big waiting list for teens and uh we already operate and have been operating for a couple of years an intensive outpatient program for adults yeah. which is about seven to ten hours of a combination of group and individual counseling each week predicated on psychological assessment uh all the things that go into building a holistic treatment plan And I started looking around for, I had a couple of teens very early on who individual counseling wasn't going to be enough. Yeah. Their parents couldn't send them to the only rehabs uh, that treated people their age because they cost a fortune. Yeah. None of the affordable places will treat that age group. There's hardly any. And I could only find a couple of teen outpatient programs and in the state of Georgia you know I can open a private practice with my counseling license right yeah and and, and a business license but to operate a program takes uh, Department of Community Health licensure which is a a big huge bureaucratic daunting process with hundreds of pages and policies and procedures and so it it's 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 really which is good that that is it is good because it, anybody can say we're a treatment place right. and they got you walking on hot coals and, uh, you know, mowing lawns That's as right. part of the treatment program, yeah. you it, know? It used to be like that, but thankfully in the last five to seven years, things have really changed. Now, there's no federal regulation, but it is, it's a state regulation. It's a state right? regulation, right? And it's yeah. different in each state. There yeah. are federal accreditations that, uh, that we can get that will kind of... The states are all trying to come in alignment. but Yeah, and I mean, this whole accreditation, we could do a whole podcast yeah. just on the flaws in that system, that there's not a lot of really good governance it's, in treatment. It, it The barrier to entry to do this is so great, nobody does it. The right. only people that do it are people like big mental health hospital companies or yeah. big companies. It's so expensive to yeah. get it off the ground. So you guys getting permission to do this is a big deal. Yeah, it took us a couple years just to get the adult IOP off the ground. Right. And it's it's significantly more complex for teens and adolescents. And hence, there was only two anywhere close to our community, and none of them were in the county I live in. Yeah. And so, Cherokee County, Georgia. And so, we decided to do it. Yeah. And going through COVID, they're not coming out the department of community health wasn't coming out to do site visits which they have to do in order to license you and i just straight up sent the director of department of community health an email saying i've got kids in crisis right now right 
and I was really impressed that they did what they had to do to get us licensed as soon yeah. as possible. They couldn't cut any corners, but they put the manpower on it. Yeah. And so now we are licensed, and we operate a uh, adolescent and teen intensive outpatient program, which is American Society of Addiction Medicine Level 2.1 treatment, right? It's kind of the highest level of care that's not rehab or partial yeah. hospitalization. Wow. And so typically what we're treating... So kids can go to school. Yeah, they go to school. We, they come back home. They, they eat dinner with their family. Maybe. <laughs> if they're not eating in their room by themselves watching TV. But um, when they're in an IOP, an IOP right. is during the course of a week they're coming in and then they get to come home and they, they get to still go to school, get yeah. their education. They're just getting the extra help they need yeah. to stay they're, sober. They're living at home. They're going to school. You know, we work all of our groups and individual sessions around school schedules, right? Yeah, that's great. Uh, a lot of kids are going to school online right now. It makes it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And so, but specifically, it's designed and we developed the curriculum, uh, which was a lot of trial and error. We also integrate a really evidence-based type of psychology called dialectical behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, and since I've been counseling a lot of teens and adolescents, and since we've started this program, it's amazing. 99% of them are struggling with the exact same things. Mm. And unfortunately, 99% of them have, have a home life that's not ideal or close to ideal. Yeah, right. So that means I'm working with the parents, yeah. and this is a whole family process. Yeah. And uh, we finally got our license, which just means now kids can use their parents' insurance to come through. You know, the first day we announced it, we almost filled up. Wow. And so, Fantastic. Yep. And so we got a couple spots available now, though. Uh, typically, it's going to be about a four-month process. Right? Might be a little longer, might be a little shorter. All the treatment plans are individualized. But that's typically 48 or 50 sessions yeah. with a combination of group and individual counseling. And we've had some, we've had some good success, really good success up to this point. That's awesome. Cool. Well, this has been great. Um, and, uh, I really appreciate you coming in talking Glad to be here, man. Cause I know that if you, if you over here talking to us, you ain't talking to a kid or one of your clients. So I appreciate you taking the time to do this yeah, man. and, um, you know, wishing you much success and uh, thankful for the work you're doing out there in Cherokee County right. at uh, Pathlight Counseling. All right. Thank you for listening. This is The Most High Show.